copy is titled um, Storage and Retrieval. And the um, so so last last chapter last week we talked a little bit about data models and query languages, and so now we're we're, we're going a layer below that to talk about uh, underlying how do you actually implement these. So um, in today's world, if you want to persist information across time and especially persisted across server crashes, things like that, um, then you need to go to disk. And so that's one of the big challenges, which is how do you take uh, information and organize it in a way that you have hopefully fast reads and fast writes and persisted on disk. And then Ryan, would you just let me know if there's anything in, in chat, if we need to pause, talk about questions sure, or anything like that. Sure, I'll stay on top of that. Yeah. Um, but but everyone feel free, this is, this is a discussion. And in particular here, I think I'm gonna go a mix of, for some concepts, go faster, you know, um, if it's something that I think maybe people are a little more familiar with. So stop me, slow me down. And then there's just a few tidbits in here that I just thought were really fun. And, and if I need to speed up, then you can also prod me and say, don't spend so much time on this one detail. Um, so, so the author begins introducing things with a motivating example where he says, hey, you know, what if you just had this giant ledger? Um, and so every time you, you want to do anything, you just insert a row at the bottom. So this is a lot like a log file, just like, you know, system logs, web logs, whatever, where you're just always adding a row at the bottom. In this case, it's a, the concept of a key value. So there's some key and then there's the payload, which could be arbitrary, any amount of, of what, any kind, any amount of data. So if you did this, then, then writing things would be very fast. And what you would do is if you said, hey, I already um, you know, inserted something for the key one, two, three, four, five. If I want to change that value, I'm not actually gonna update it. I'm just gonna create a new entry at the bottom. And the, the convention is if you have more than one key, one, two, three, four, five, then you read the bottommost one, the most recent one. And then all the other ones are obsolete. So even if they're physically still there, they're designed to be ignored. And if you do this, you'll actually get really fast performance on writes uh, because you don't have to go looking for where to write. You're just writing everything you know, right there at the end. But the problem is that um, if you read from this structure, then worst case scenario, basically you're scanning through the entire table, uh, the entire database from top to bottom. Um, and so that's gonna be linear time with the number of entries. So if you've got a billion entries, you've got a trillion entries, then it just keeps getting slower and slower. Um, so although nice and simple, that's uh, probably not gonna give you the responsiveness that you want. So I, I, uh, I like this sort of uh, loose terminology here, where if you add any kind of data structures, any kind of metadata, loosely we can call these indexes, okay? Like maybe, there's other names for things that are more specific, but if we just loosely call them indexes, then the general pattern is when you write something, you need to update this metadata, you need to update these indexes. And that is going to add some amount of cost to your writes. So what you're doing is this log has a super fast write to begin with, you can afford if you make it 10% slower. Um, but what you're trying to do is do that in a way that it tremendously speeds up your read performance. And then, of course, everything, you know, depends on your, the profile of your, your uh, workload as to, you know, what types of optimizations might, um, might make the biggest difference. So if we were to talk about this chronologically, we would probably start with relational databases and then get into um, these other sort of log structured um, storage systems. I, I think the author kind of went this way because he's trying to sort of build up concepts from sort of simpler things to, to more complex. So, so we will certainly get to uh, the relational systems, but first there's a tour through increasing levels of complexity with how do you take this simple idea of a, of a simple log file and add metadata, add indexes to it in such a way that now you can actually improve read performance dramatically. 
Um, so the first concept is hashing. Um, I I suspect most people are familiar with hashing uh, at some level, whether it's you know in programming languages versus not necessarily in databases. But so the whole idea is that you know if you um, if you can do a hash function that takes your key and and turns it into a relatively unique value, um, then basically you can just look up against um, that hash value and it, you can have a pointer that says, oh, instead of reading through this entire giant log file, if you go all the way to byte six, seven, eight, nine, that's where you'll find the information that you want. And interestingly enough, you can actually build a viable system with just this. You just have a hash map and, and it points to where all of your data is. Um, the problem if you do just this vanilla system is that your log file is still going to just grow and grow and grow and grow. So a simple thing you can do is you break the log file into segments every so often and you could theoretically keep them all, but it's still going to grow and grow and grow. And especially if you have a lot of updates, those old portions of your log file, they've got junk that's been deprecated. You don't really need to keep it around anymore. So then the idea is then you can do this compaction process where you say, hey, I've already overwritten the key one, two, three, four, five, a hundred times. Those 99 other copies, I can remove them. So what I can do is I can just take these old files, um, make a copy, delete anything that's now you know obsolete, and I'll have a much smaller log file in the process. Hey, while I'm at it, not only can I remove those obsolete entries, but since these are much smaller, why don't I merge them together? Because you know, on disks, you don't want tiny little files. It's more efficient to access you know, bigger chunks. And so, so now that, that gives us the concept of basically we've got compaction and, uh, and so you can have a system that, that perform, that's quite performant where all you're doing is saying, I'm gonna break my log file into chunks and in the background, I'm gonna have this process that periodically um, compacts the, the old log segments. So that's sort of our first level of, here's a system that, that there are versions of this that actually exist in the real world, we can implement this. So let me pause here, any comments or questions? Um, I, I wrote this on the chat as well, but I mean, if you have an index pointing at the data locations, then why would you be writing to the end of the log file? You would just directly write to wherever the data is, wouldn't you? Yeah, so, so this is where talking about logs first is kind of backwards. So um, the whole idea here is that uh, when we talk about relational structures, we update in place, which is exactly what you're saying. It's, it, it's actually, to me, it's the far more intuitive way you would do it, right? Yeah. Why would you go and write something at the end? When, yeah. um, but disks, especially spinning disks, are very poor at random access. And be, because random access can be slow, and in particular, it's, it's not just slow in terms of latency, in terms of how long does it take me to get one particular thing read or one particular thing read, uh, written because I'm waiting for the disk to come around and for the head to then, you know, get to that spot. Um, but the other problem is that the whole time that you're waiting for that disk to spin around and, and get to the right spot, you're also not doing anything else. Yeah. You're not reading anything else or writing anything else either. So it also affects throughput. Um, so, so it's affecting latency and throughput. And so the fundamental principle of using logs is that you do a whole bunch of writes. So let's say I log 100 things, 1,000 things. I'm doing those sequentially, and I'm really maximizing the use of my disk for that period of time because I'm just you know, doing this, this big sequential uh, write. Yeah, I think that was a database called Tokyo something. Um, I think they were doing a system like that. Yeah, so, so I would say the unintuitive nature of writing duplicative data is why relational databases were around for 20, 30, 40 years before people realistically started looking at the idea of we could actually get better performance by 
making more copies of the data. Yeah. Okay. Um, but generally speaking, it's it's that right concentration. And then also the other thing is because you know that these old log segments are read only, that they will never be updated, that gives you, um, I don't know the right way to say it, but that makes your life simpler in terms of when you're doing the compaction, it's very easy because what you can do is you can read, you can read something, you can write the new version of it, like when you're just deleting obsolete entries. And at no point do you have to worry about, is it gonna change on you during the time it takes you to read this compacted and write it because it's read only. And if you wanted hypothetically, you could wait five minutes after you've compacted it before you tell people, hey, go point to the new compact one instead of the old one. And there's no harm, no foul because it's read only. So it's those, those two properties, especially the read only gives you um, uh, I don't know what the right way to say it is, but the, that guarantee allows you to come up with ideas for how you do things that you can't do in something that's constantly changing. Yeah. Hey, Ted, this may be the wrong time and we can delay this till later on, but I was kind of curious how solid state drives figure in, into this, right? And, and whether they change the discussion. And I believe even with solid state drives, it's not true that it's, it's completely random access, that you still have to read clumps of bits or bytes together sort of thing, but I didn't have the time to look it up. I don't know if anybody else here knows, uh, I do not know SSDs, but I've read multiple times in lots of places that both reads and writes are actually accessing blocks within SSDs. And so uh, in, in RAM, you can truly just say, uh, write an integer at one, two, three, four, five, and then write another integer at six, seven, eight, nine. And it's kind of like the same performance as if you said one, two, three, four, five, and then write something at one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, adjacent places, right? right. Um, and, and it's not quite that free uh, uh, performance with SSDs. That's my understanding else. too. Yeah, yeah. To add. Re regarding SSDs, when you look at their benchmark numbers, they'll typically show you different QDAPs, which is basically how many tasks are, are backed up and it's kind of prefetching them. And then you'll also see variations on the block size. And so you can see when it's fetching different attempted sizes of, of files, basically. And you can see how the performance changes when you change the, the size of the files that they're trying to request. And lots of little tiny files is still going to potentially um, bring it to its knees. And so another factor that SSDs are graded on is their IOPS, the, the amount of operations they can do. And so you typically want super high IOPS and then you can kind of deal with small files well too. Cool, thanks Ryan. Yeah, so the bottom line is even if you switch to SSDs to a certain extent, you still have the these disk versus memory performance patterns. It's it's faster, it's better, but you still have that pattern apparently. All right, so that so we talked about simple unordered write only at the end log files. And so then we get to SS tables and LS entries. This was new to me. I don't know about you guys. Um, I had to kind of go through this material to 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 really understand it. So um, the idea is that okay I just said the great thing about log files is you write everything right at the bottom and it's all contiguous. Well, if it's sorted, then obviously you can't do that. You can't just always write everything at the bottom because if you have a Z followed by an A, you can't write the A at the bottom. The A has to go at the beginning. Um, and so this talks about, well, how do we approach that? Um, and so the basic idea is that if you have sorted files, uh, uh, Mostly, I'm still going to call them log files, although although SS tables technically they're not really logs anymore because now you're writing, you know. But um, what you can do is instead of every time somebody wants to write something, you immediately spit it out, right? What you can do is you can accumulate a certain amount of work in memory, and then after you've accumulated that work, you then spit out a big batch and you write that to a file uh, segment. And the idea there is that you're not technically going to be appending to those the way you do to logs, 
but you're still doing this thing where you're doing a long contiguous write. So if I have you know 50 megabytes that um, I've saved up in memory and now I want to push it out to disk in sorted order, um, um, that write of 50 megabytes contiguously can be done very efficiently by disk systems. And you know, there's gory details about how the controllers will sort of pipeline stuff and yada, 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 caches, whatever. Uh, but so the bottom line is that the disk system can handle writing a 50 megabytes way, way, way more efficiently than if you issued 500 individual, you know, 100K writes, for example. And so, so it's still, it's not quite append only, but it's still got that pattern of this read only write in big sequential batches. So you got these SS tables, these are these sorted log segments. Then it goes into more detail about LSM trees, which is, which is how you, um, again, you have these multiple tiers. So in memory, uh, author doesn't go into detail, but life's a lot easier in memory. So you can manage keeping things in order. Um, there's, there's balanced trees in particular, like red, black binary trees is a way in which you can insert things um, in any particular order and you will get a balanced tree that has good you know, log and read performance. Um, uh, but you can trivially read records out of it in sorted order. Um, so that's what that's taking taken care of. Um, and so then the idea is that basically you, you keep a decent chunk of stuff in memory, you periodically write stuff out um, to, to disk, and now you've got sort of uh, two things going on. So one is before when we were compacting, we didn't care about order. Now we do care about order, but if you're familiar with merge sort, or if you've ever had two piles of papers that were both already in sorted and you just wanted to sort the collection, there's a fairly efficient algorithm where you just say, okay, here's a bunch of A's. Uh, the, the, you know, the first item I have on the second stack is a B, so I can just skip ahead straight to the B's, insert that, and interleave those two. So it's a very efficient linear order algorithm. The other thing that was mentioned is that in the traditional hash map world, because any record can be anywhere, you need a full map that tells you how to find every single item. Well, now that you know that things are sorted, if let's, let's just use numbers instead of, of strings. So if you have um, a pointer that says, here's where item one million and one is, um, if you're looking for item 1 million and five, you don't necessarily really need a direct pointer to 1 million and five. You can just go to 1 million and one and then you can just kind of walk sequentially through um, the list because you know it's sorted and you know it's going to be close. So um, that's considered good enough. And so that's where this, this comment is that you can have partial indexes. You don't have to have an index for every single entry. You just sort of have periodic things that says where things are. Um, and then there's a trade-off because obviously uh, if between a million one and a million and five, there were 50,000 entries actually, not, not just a handful. Well, then I would have made the mistake and I would have had to linearly walk through 50,000 entries before I got to the one I actually wanted. Um, so you need you know kind of balance that, but that's, that's kind of a cool uh, optimization. Um, all right, so the idea here is that writing um, is, you sort of have this uh, delay action happening with writes because it's, it's sort of going in memory and then it eventually. So write performance is as good if not actually better um, than if you just have an ordinary not ordered log table. Um, and then reads, you've got a little more overhead. You, you, you know, um, you've got this in-memory part and then you've got these other things. Um, but one of the key things to understand is that for just handling user requests, things are probably really good. Where things get a little bit dangerous is we now have these two background processes. We have the compaction process, okay? 
and we have the process that says, let's take a chunk of things that are in memory, write them out to disk and remove them from memory. And so, you know, one of the comments later on is if you have really high volumes of activity, you can get to the point where those background processes can't keep up. Um, and so uh, that's where things can get really dicey and your failure mode can be a lot more unpredictable. Whereas we'll see with relational, you actually could run into a bandwidth issue, but it's actually much more predictable. What happens is just response time gets worse. You know, you can't have sort of this overflow kind of, kind of a situation. All right, let me pause here. So this kind of took me a little while to wrap my head around how the, the, the ordered files um, can work since obviously, you again, you're not be able to write to the end of them. You always have to write. So any questions, any comments? I have a question. So they're both ordered, correct? But this, the SS tables are just ordered in a different way because the um, what should we call it? The hash tables had the indexes as well, but then um, how is that? Basically, what's the difference between the two? So the hash tables are not ordered at all in any way. Oh, so okay. what's an index for a hash? So, so sorry, your in-memory hash lookup is ordered on the hashes. Oh, okay. okay. Gotcha. But the disk is the disk storage is just completely sequential, oh, no okay. no sense. Okay, okay. so the difference between the disk storage and then the um, in memory, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So so if you you know insert whatever cherry banana apple, then they just go in the log cherry banana apple. Whereas when you have an LSM tree, the and if you put cherry banana and apple in. On the physical disk file, it's going to be apple, banana, cherry. It's going to be in alphabetical order. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what has to happen is it has to build up a bunch of stuff in memory, and then it says, oh, I'm going to write these things now out in sorted order into a, a, a segment, a chunk. Okay, cool. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anybody else? There's a couple in chat. Yeah, um, I, I, I wrote those. So. Uh, LSM is, um, it, it sounds very much like how the SQL databases store the tables, is it not? What's the difference? Uh, the in-memory part of LSM can be identical to how SQL stores information. Okay. But the disk part of it is very different. How, how is that different? So the disk part is using large ordered log files, okay? And so there's no tree structure on the disk whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, database, in database tables, like the actual data is not sorted either, right? It actually is. So, so, <laughs> the, the, so if I had, um, if I have an index, we'll, we'll get to relational in just a second, but, but the basic concept is that my indexing of the information, whether it's using a field in the data as an index or whether I'm just using, you know, a fake uh, index that I've created on my own. Yeah. Um, ultimately, that index is built into a tree yeah. and that tree is in sorted order and that the links that connect the different nodes of the tree um, are sorting the different pages on the disk. The disks are not physically contiguously laid out necessarily in sorted order, yeah. but there's, yeah. but the data structure is linked um, in that way. Yeah. Uh, it, SS it, tables, yeah. SS tables in an LSM tree are age related, but there is no linking between them. So you could have any kind of random thing in, um, in SS tables. So you could have an old SS table that has apple, banana, cherry, and you could have a newer SS table that has, um, I don't know, you know, Al, Bob, and Charlie. And there's just no, each individual file is sorted, but there's just no relationship between different 
SS table segments that are written to the disk. Well, yes, yes. I, I wasn't referring to that aspect. I was referring just from a just one table perspective. Um, it's very similar to the SQL databases, just taking one table only. Okay. I mean, if that if that helps you think about it, yeah. um, that's great. I, mm -hmm. I, I think for me, whatever reason, that's not the way I think of it, but yeah. but um, yeah. And also, um, if you were to just um, say, uh, partition the underlying um, log file, um, like sorted is worse than hash indexes. Is that correct? Like if, if you were to be um, partitioning the, uh, the, the file itself um, in different computers, then you want random access as much as possible. And so hash indexes would distribute the load better, right? Uh, not sure. One of the things I actually say at the very end of the notes is that this chapter currently only talks about vertical scaling. So oh. the entire part two of the book is about replication, sharding, okay. transactions, and all of those issues. So, okay. so yes, it's a really good question. Cool. I, I have sort of a broad question on this one. What, what do you think are takeaway and, and how valuable do you think this is? Because at least from my perspective, realistically, I'm never going to be making a decision between SS tables and LSM trees. I, I'm just going to have some database that has already implemented them. So is there really much value in trying to dig in and understand the, the underlying structure? I think, I think the author's point is um, you, thank goodness, won't need to implement one of these unless you just decide it's your love and you want yeah. to work for one of these companies. But understanding this will help you decide, should I choose Oracle? Should I choose Cassandra? Should I choose something else? Mm -hmm. Right, because I know underneath the hood what it is that they're doing. Okay, what I would say is that I think that for this case that's covered in just what's covered in chapter three, LSM trees make a viable alternative to um, to relational B trees. Um, I haven't read ahead far enough to know, but I suspect when you start talking about workloads that have a lot of updates, so a transactional OLTP system, and you want to start doing things like, you know, atomicity, you know, acid guarantees and stuff, that life just is going to get more and more and more complicated with these with these multiple SS tables and and duplicate copies of keys that are, you know, whatever, obsolete. And when you try to do locking, how do you do locking when you've got multiple SS tables that are all are A to Z? And I, I just think that you're not. But for an analytic workload, so if you're trying to implement a data warehouse, I could see that alternatives like LSM trees and column stores, because it's primarily read only. I mean, you have bulk inserts, but you're not doing updates on the fly throughout the day. I think that that kind of a workload uh, might get really good horizontal scaling out of this architecture because B trees are hard to scale horizontally. Well, so we'll I, see if my prediction's right. I don't know if that's where the author is going to go. I also think it's really valuable to understand things like clustered indexes versus compound indexes versus primary indexes and stuff like that, even when you're just a developer. And then beyond that, I mean, I'll, I'll kind of reiterate what you said, Ted, as well. Um, if you if your system is going to do mostly OLAP versus OLTP, um, you might want to lean towards one kind of database versus another. The other thing to take into consideration is, from what I've been reading, uh, if you store information in the cloud services in an OLTP type format, so row, row format versus a column format, there's a significant difference in the price oh uh, you know column formats are much cheaper that's good 
All right, so there's one thing that I wanted to talk about here, which this is where you guys might need to stop me, but um, um, are you guys familiar with bloom filters? Because bloom filters are really cool. They're amazing. <laughs> and so, no, so I, saw, I saw this comment in the book. Um, so basically, like if you have a hash table and let's say you hash to a billion different unique values, okay? Um, the odds of two different keys just accidentally hashing to the same exact value are one in a billion. But if you have a million entries already in your hash table, the odds of you hashing to something else that's the same as any one of those, well, now that's dropped to the odds are one in a thousand, right? Because you've got a thousand times as many possible hash values as, as actual entries. So the bloom filter, what it does is it does multiple separate independent hashes. And so if you have a one in a thousand chance of, of the first hash matching, but you do seven hashes, well, now you've got uh, roughly, things are not necessarily purely statistically independent, but roughly speaking, a thousand to the seventh power chance that all seven of them have a collision, even though this key, you know, doesn't actually exist. So when you use a bloom filter, it's basically just hashing multiple times and any one of them can give you a false positive because you get a collision. Um, if you get no matches on all seven of them, then it's a guarantee that this key doesn't already exist in there. If you do see uh, ones in all seven of your hashes, then it is possible that um, it's a false positive but the odds of it are really low. And by configuring the size of your hash and the, si then the number of hashes you do, you can actually design in what level of guarantee you want on the, on the probability of a false positive. Um, so, so basically, and you can look on Wikipedia, but basically, so bloom filters are really cool. They take up very little space because they're bitmaps. You only need a one or a zero for, for each hash. And, um, um, and so, so the optimization you mentioned is that uh, when you look for a key and it's not in an LSM tree, that's actually the slowest scenario because you are going to search through every single one of your old SS tables. Um, and you can look at the newest one and it's gonna say, not there. Then you can look at the second newest one, not there. Third newest one, not there until you go through every single one of them. So finding something you might get lucky and find it quickly but something that's not there is always going to be sort of worst case scenario. And so the idea is you apply a bloom filter up front. And so depending on the bloom filter, you may have say a 99.999% chance that if it's not there, you're going to know it right off the bat. And you don't even have to bother looking at a single SS table. And again, you can design the size of the bloom filter to guarantee that it's only a, you know, one in a trillion chance of a false positive, but it's still really fast even if you are, are trying to get those kinds of guarantees. Okay, so let's, let's circle back now to B trees. So again, chronologically, B trees came first. In some ways, I think that, that B trees are more understandable. Um, just so you know, my notes here are not necessarily uh, exactly in order in the sequence in which the author talked about these, but I've tried to sort of distill the concepts, you know, consensually, uh, conceptually. So the big difference here is that B trees, they don't create duplicate entries, but they allow deletes and updates to take, uh, to happen in place. Um, because of the nature of disks, it's more efficient instead of storing each record separately, um, it, it's, it's more efficient to, to organize them into pages. Typically what happens is disks are arranged in blocks anyway. And so what you're doing is you're just writing um, whole blocks at a time. So if you're familiar with trees, um, right? So reads and writes are logarithmic in time. So on a binary tree, um, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's a thousand entries, it might only be 10 levels deep. And so, you know, the log base two of a thousand is 10. Um, 
there are these algorithms, there are these data structures that are balanced trees. And so the B and B tree comes from um, the word balance. And, but B trees are an extension of bi balanced binary trees. So instead of having two-way branching, you can have an arbitrarily large number of branches. So the root, instead of having two children, it could have 500 children. It could have 2,000 children. Um, and so uh, in practice, if you have a bee tree that, that's branching somewhere between 500 and 2,000 ways at each node, even pretty large databases are actually not very deep. And so you can see that like you can have 10 billion entries in a database and only be four levels deep. Um, so that's, that's fairly low overhead in terms of adding four additional reads just to get from the root to a leaf. And that's, if you, that's without talking about caching and, and other kinds of optimizations. Um, there is, without going to the gory details about how the algorithm works, um, but B trees do have this thing where sometimes if say you're doing insert and the maximum number of records you can hold in one page is, is 300. If you try and insert a 301st entry, it's gonna sort of overflow. And so then what that needs to do is that needs to split that page into two pages. Um, and it also pushes activity up to the parent of that particular node. Um, and it can, on, in the worst case scenario, recursively cause that parent to overflow and have to split and so on and so forth. But again, if the height of your B tree is three, four, or five, you're really only talking about a worst case scenario of five page splits to do one insert. But that is an extra level of overhead that needs to get amortized or needs to get dealt with in terms of your sort of worst case performance. The other big thing about using um, update in place is that you now have this scary thing about what happens if I'm halfway through some kind of an update or what if I'm halfway through doing all these page splits and my computer crashes. Um, so you can get inconsistent, corrupted data in your B-tree structure. Um, and so that's why every B-tree implementation I know of uh, uses a write-ahead log. And so in this case, what you do is you say on the log, here's what I'm about to do. Um, you then in some way timestamp it. You go and you make those changes to your B-tree and then either in the log or somewhere you know, adjacent to the log, you say, okay, everything up to this timestamp, I've actually successfully written to the B-tree. Um, so what can happen is if your computer crashes, you can actually look at this log and you can say, oh, look, there's there, every, it says everything up till you know, 109 has been written, but there's a couple entries that are at 110, 111. Um, I can actually redo, I can replay those, those entries um, in order to, to catch up what didn't actually get written to the B tree. So to kind of add on to that, that's kind of similar how like in memory databases kind of um, cover durability where like in the case where something goes down and memory, you know, disappears, then you have this like change log that basically backs up um, the changes that have occurred. So, um, yep. and I think I've read the part in the chapter where as like the whole part of like writing to disk was that it was durable and then it was like cheaper than RAM at one point. But as like RAM becomes more cheaper and that's where like the um the, the increase of like in memory databases became a thing and um how that kind of relates to change logs and what B trees um basically utilize. Um as Ted said. Yeah, and this chapter, that's, 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 that's a great comment. And this chapter doesn't really go into too much how some of all of this is, um, is unnecessary because of how much caching, because of the, the cost of, of RAM and in particular fast cache memory has gone down. There's more and more caching available. And so in many cases, when you say, um, I would like to know the description for product ID 
one, two, three, four. You don't actually have to go and search through the B tree. You don't actually have to go to the disk because it's just sitting there in cache. Uh, because because one two three four is a really popular product. It's just sitting in, in in cache, and so it doesn't go through any of this rigmarole trying to find right. it. Right, that's where like, LLRU caching like plays into a role. Um, yes. But like I I guess like I mean so trade off is always going to be like an ongoing like theme in this book where um, the trade off <laughs> is that initially it's going to be expensive because you have to have like the entry point to you know, start the caching, but subsequent um, reads, um, since you have the cache, it'll decrease um, the time it takes for reads. Um, yeah. But like you said, look with um, RAM um, becoming more cheaper, which leads to, you know, more caching, um, the need um, to write into disk becomes less prevalent when you can store more um, frequently seeked out information um, through the cache than um, through disk. Yep, thanks. Um, I have a few other notes here just in terms of con concurrency control and optimizations. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. So, so the author talks about some comparisons between B trees and LSM trees. Um, Ryan asked the question, I talked about that a little bit. So um, I think that if you had an environment that was primarily writes and not reads, then some sort of log-based technology like an LSM tree might actually outperform. Um, I think also for a mostly read-only is where you can try and design things. Um, the reason why you still see uh, relational database systems being very popular is because they, they are flexible and um, I've most of my career been a Microsoft SQL Server guy. And so without going into the gory details, there's just a ton of optimizations that Microsoft has made to improve performance for certain kinds of circumstances. So for example, you can read a ginormous table sequentially from beginning to end extremely quickly in SQL Server because they have these other indexes, this other metadata that tells um, the system, how the data is laid out on disk, that's not just the, the basic B tree, it's additional data structures. And those are optimized for these other use cases. And so, you know, computers are fast enough that for the common case, you just don't really care about that little extra overhead you have storing these bit maps and extent maps and things like that. Um, but when you have that really heavy duty use case, when you can then, you know, sort of parallelize and pipeline these read operations, that's when you see huge uh, performance boosts from these, these additional kinds of optimizations. Um, so then there's sort of this next part of the chapter where the author talks about other indexing structures. So Stephen mentioned, so secondary indexes can be very important I'm not exactly sure how people implement secondary indexes on LSM trees, but for B trees, it's, it's, it's super duper commonplace. And so on, um, on an OLTP system, you know, um, you'll see some indexes on a more analytical system. You typically will see some secondary indexes on every single table. And so the whole idea is that if you have orders that are sorted by order date, well, maybe you have a secondary index on product ID, maybe you have a secondary index on client ID. Um, and this allows you to, you know, very quickly go to items that have particular things. So you can just imagine you write a where clause, you say, you know, show me the stuff, the, the, the orders where client equals one, two, three, that's where you may be able to use a, a, a secondary index. Um, I will comment without going into too much detail that when you start doing range queries, if you say, give me the 5,000 rows um, for customer one, two, three, that secondary index might not actually be helpful at the end of the day uh, because you're, you're pulling 5,000 sort of random things. So even though you have this index, um, just kind of beware that, that, that the primary indexes and everything we've talked about here, very high performance, 
Secondary indexes often don't um, give you that same kind of bang for your buck. And that's why the author does mention the idea of multi-column indexes and covering indexes, which, are, which allow you to skip actually reading full records because all the information you need is contained in the columns in the covering index. We talked a little bit about, you can sort of skip all this stuff and just put everything in memory. So with RAM getting cheaper, um, some of this is obviated by caching that can happen just sort of behind the scenes. So for example, when you have uh, really large disk caches, um, you can write software that is dumb and just keeps trying to read from disk, but you'll get really fast performance because the disk cache is gonna return the result to you without ever telling the controller to actually go read it off the physical disk. Um, and you don't even know that's happening. So, so that actually helps a little bit in terms of it's abstracted away from you. You just get better performance from that disk cache and you don't necessarily have to have all these other data structures and secondary data structures that you're, you're managing and you try to, to improve performance. All right, so let me just pause here before we talk about data warehousing and and analytic uh, workloads. Any other things people want to talk about? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask, there was something there, can you go up a little bit? Um, it, it said multi-dimensional indexes. I, I was wondering like, um, cause I, I remember reading from the Microsoft analysis server, um, which, which is OLAP. It, it says that it doesn't really need indexes, but then it has this concept called aggregations uh, and what, what is these uh, multi-dimensional indexes um, that you're mentioning here? Are they the same thing as aggregations or is it something different? It's something different. So uh, in this next section about analytic processing, we're gonna talk about um, how you can pre-compute and store aggregations. Like for example, sums are really common, you know, sales yeah. totals, right? Um, uh, I've done some queries that are um, geospatial queries. So for example, you know, um, um, here is an address. What county does this person live in? What, okay. And, and so you have a polygon that defines each county and you are doing a geospatial intersect to see whether this point, this latitude and longitude is, is inside of that polygon. Yeah. Okay. For geospatial, you have latitude and longitude and you cannot just use a traditional A to Z linear index. It's two-dimensional. So that's an example of a multi-dimensional index. And so uh, current versions of Microsoft SQL Server uh, uh, support um, spatial indexes, which are, which are multi-dimensional. OK, which is different from the OLAP aggregations. Yes, yes. So it's so just another complexity, completely different concept. Yes. Okay, very good, thank you. There's also full text indexes. I don't know that much about full text indexes, but again, a, another slightly different kind of index. All right, um, analytic processing. I think most people are probably familiar with that. So uh, I don't know we need to go into too much detail, but so it's pretty common to see you've got your quote unquote production server. That's your OLTP server. And then they're gonna say, here's a read-only copy uh, of the data that you can run all of your Tableau reports, big queries, you know, queries, whatever against this, this second thing. So you can call it a data warehouse, you can call it other names, uh, but the whole point is that this is a duplicate copy of the data. Um, in the old days, you would have fairly stale data. You might say, I only update this warehouse daily, weekly, monthly. Um, nowadays, people demand stuff, so you see more streaming. But the whole idea is it's a primarily read-only second copy of stuff. Um, the old days, you mostly saw relational schemas. So you see the uh, star schema, and, and, and if you expand that, the snowflake schema. Um, so you have large fact tables. And the key thing the author talks about is that a fact table easily could have hundreds of columns. Um, and when you want to know the sales total um, by region, by store, by department, 
you really probably only need roughly ish four columns region department store id and amount and so this table might have 400 columns but if you're only using a handful of those in your query that's where uh, the conversation transitions to oh we could store this data in a columnar way where i store all the amounts physically in chunks as opposed to these other systems it's always records that are being chunked together so when your record is 400 columns wide it's a really big record and you only need four or five of those columns you're doing a whole lot of of um you're reading a whole lot of data when actually only a tiny portion of it is the part you really need So let me see. Um, other cool things about column stores is there's a lot of compression you can do. So um, uh, they talk about bitmap coding. I'm very familiar with doing run length encoding. And I believe uh, what, what Microsoft SQL Server does in column store data is that they will take a really large table and they'll actually break it into chunks. So the whole idea is that you want to have relatively few unique values in a particular column, then you can get really good performance. Um, so if you have a small table, then it's just going to be one chunk. But if you had a table that had, let's say, 100 million rows, then it, let's say it divided into 25 million row chunks, it can have a separate lookup table for each chunk to say, what are the unique values in column one for the first 20 million rows? What are the unique values in column two? And oftentimes, just due to the nature of these kinds of data, you may have like slowly moving stuff over time. So if the first chunk is 2000, the second chunk is 2001, the third chunk is 2002, you can imagine, for example, product IDs. Certain products didn't exist back in 2000. So you don't need every possible product ID in in that in that column for the 2000 data you just need the ones that actually existed back in 2000 and vice versa when you're looking at 2020 a lot of the old products from 2000 don't exist anymore and so that's a further optimization they do to say that there's fewer unique values in each chunk instead of treating the entire column always as one giant column when you're doing things like the bitmap encoding and the run length encoding um, there's a little bit talk about vectorized performance. Uh, I'm not that familiar with it, but basically you can you can do SIMD instructions. And so if you say, I have this contiguous chunk of memory, I want to and these 100 values with these other 100 values, um, and they're all loaded in cache, then uh, basically you issue one instruction to the CPU, and it will go and internally loop through all 100 rows of that data. And that's going to be much, much faster than you explicitly saying, load the first one, do an and, load the second one, do an and, load the third one, do an and, as individual uh, instructions. Um, and then a few comments on sort order. So um, you can sort columnar data. And if you do that, then especially one of the benefits you get from this is that first, it allows you to do range queries really easily. But the other thing is that um, um, you get really good compression on your on your sort keys uh, because you're going to get very long contiguous ranges of values. The run length encoding on those things is going to be microscopic in size. Uh, and then I was not familiar with this, but the author mentioned this thing called CStore where um, we haven't talked about replication yet, but just you know, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna wind up storing five copies of the data just for redundancy for protection purposes, what if you did this clever thing and you said the five copies can be sorted by different things? So one copy is sorted by store ID, one copy is stored sorted by uh, department ID, one copy is sorted by customer ID. So then, if you say I want the data where customers one, two, three, then you go to that copy. If you, if you say, I want to know the totals of sales for store um, ABC, then you go to a different copy. So I thought that was kind of a cool, uh, clever idea. Um, any comments about data warehouses and column stores? 
I, I kind of have a question, but like, but more related to really the AWS kind of ecosystem here. I, and I don't know, kind of given this this background here, does anyone have uh, any thoughts or comments on how you may be using S3, even though S3 is usually considered as like the storage place, but I have seen also almost like increasing um, kind of a, 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 a habit of querying against uh, S3 directly. And then what's the relationship between the S3 and Redshift and then a Postgres database like uh, a little bit downstream? I hope my question- So I don't know kind of if, if like Keegan's still on, I think of S3 as a file system and less of a database, but, but somebody who's more experienced in this, do you have a, an answer for Becky? Yeah, so S3 is object storage. So you're, you're storing objects, so like pictures, mm -hmm. um, Word documents, but you can use a service called Athena, which lets, right, you, exactly. which lets you query like a CSV file and run a SQL query on it. I think it's using, um, it's, it's, it's based off um, a open source tool. I can't remember the name of it. It's, it was something Netflix used. Um, I, I just, the name's escaping me, but it's using an open source pesto, pesto. That's, that's mm -hmm. what, that's what's cool. I, I just remembered it. Um, presto or presto. Um, <laughs> I can't, I can't remember. It's been a while since I looked at it, but. Um, it's Facebook's presto. Yeah. It's uh, so Athena is basically presto under the hood. And so S3 is still, um, still object oriented storage uh but they're they're basically just doing a managed version of presto so you can look at the csv file and mm -hmm. i guess they i don't know what file system they have i mean aws also has traditional traditional rds instances so you right. see postgres and sql server and then they also have like dynamo db which is a no sql database they have um they have MongoDB, which is again a NoSQL database. I don't know what file systems they use because they're they're proprietary and most of them are closed source. But um, S3 is just object storage, so I don't know. Um, yeah. you base, I, I guess when you, they use Presto, they I, I don't know how that works. I would yeah. So actually, so so perhaps super simplistically, I would mm -hmm. say I wouldn't think that if you, uh, let's say you, you were you were making a competitor to Google Drive, right, and, and you're going to have millions of users all storing files, you probably can't use S3 natively just by itself. You need something that's going to give you more of a database-like interface for doing reads and writes, and so that's where you know, Presto or something, you know, comes in. And obviously then you can also use either a relational database or a, a, a NoSQL database as well. Does that make sense? Right, right. So, so S3, we currently actually um, mainly use it for the reading the CSV file and actually Athena actually works quite great, uh, exactly like a relational uh, database environment. So we were pleasantly surprised by, by that. But then my question is, if you think about the cheaper cost the S3 has, right? And then a rush shift at a higher cost and then a Postgres or IDS um, incidents, what's really the benefit of, let's say using rush shift in this case? It, it's, it's a, a kind of column-based kind of a storage format there, but what's the really the benefit of using it? You, that, know, you, couldn't, use, you couldn't use S3 if you had a million customers and have nothing else right. layered on top of it, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. you, you would be crushed it would be the performance would be super duper slow it it depends what you're doing too like so athena's really good for if if like if you're doing tons and tons of reads i'm not sure if you'd run into a performance bottleneck but you'd probably it wouldn't be as economically efficient at a certain mm -hmm. point athena's mm -hmm. really good for hey we need to do a query you know once every day or once every couple days and it's you know, it's, you, you aren't paying because for Redshift or Snowflake or one of these other enterprise data warehouses, you're, you're bringing up multiple nodes. You're basically, you're paying by the hour for, and you're probably paying for multiple servers by the hour for high availability. So if, 
I mean, it really depends how much data and really how much you're querying it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, um, I think Athena is actually, if you're just running a couple queries, it's fine. But if you're running, you know, like a query every 10 minutes and you're querying, you know, like hundreds of gigs of data, then it becomes a problem. Right? In S3, there's no limit to the number of files you can put in a bucket, but any individual file can't be more than five terabytes. And right. if it's a five right. terabyte file, it's going to take a very, very long time to upload. Um, AWS and I think other cloud providers, they have ways that you can mitigate this when you upload files. So if you have like a five terabyte file, you can actually, they can still send you a box and you can upload the data into this, this called snow, snowmobile and snow, uh, it's snow. So, so Keegan, if you don't mind my jumping in, see, I think your assuming typical workload. What, what I'm trying to, to address in Becky's question is, if you have a database, it's not unreasonable to say you're gonna have 100 million entries in there, okay? You would not put 100 million files all in one single S3 bucket. True, true. That's gonna reduce your performance, okay? Because it's not optimized for finding a particular item within a bucket for large N. So then you need somebody else to manage how to divide things up and organize it. And that's where these technologies we're talking about actually mm -hmm. do that kind of organization. They could ultimately write their stuff to S3. That's not a problem. I'm just saying that without going to the gory details, if, if your company has a thousand files, whatever, just, just use S3. Don't pay for something else more expensive. But the use cases we're talking about here are where you have things on the orders of millions, billions, trillions. Now you want a database. You, you want something that's organizing things for you. And then perhaps you want something that allows you to do joins and actually link different pieces of data together. Right. I think I... S3. Right. I think the point is very clear, uh, Ted, on that exact point. I think and maybe my my question here can 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 wait for another discussion. I, I think at this point we are a little bit wrestling with the various um, kind of uh, components of the ecosystem, right? So S three certainly has its purpose and and benefits, and then Redshift, and then the Postgres database. So th there's uh, some decisions that we kind of need to make, and I'm still very fuzzy about exactly. Like given all like like Keegan's kind of point about it all depends like what your applications are and and the size of the data and the kind of the trade offs you are making and all of that. So, uh, but but overall, I, I'm I, I do have some curiosity around what everyone is using in terms of their overall kind of tech stack uh, at some point. Uh, if people can share some of those, you, you can. Yeah, I think may, maybe we could look at having some conversation along those lines. Um, what I would say right now relative to chapter three is if your data is small enough that you're willing to personally manage it. So uh, when I think about my C drive, I think about folders and subfolders, okay? Uh, you, you might be doing S3 buckets and I, I don't remember the nomenclature for like folders within buckets or whatever. You got, a, you know, 5,000 files, or whatever. You wanna organize that by different clients, by different whatever projects. Go for it, just do it. But you are manually managing that. At the point where you say, I don't want to manage it, then you need some other tool, I'll loosely call it a database, that manages that for you, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you can decide on based on the workload. Again, I'm saying this because just from our past conversations, I, I suspect that your company's not that big. So you probably do not need some super high-end thing because you're not dealing with writing hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of things per day. If, if the data gets that big though, you could use Spark on S3. Right, right. So you could do- I, I mean, the size is about, it's not huge. It's just a, uh, a, couple, uh, a couple of terabytes of data. It's but but it's not even the volume, I'm saying the number of things, right? R right, but- um, Right, if, if you have, you know, 30, 100 gigabyte objects, it's still only 30 objects. You don't need a database to manage them for you. You could just say, 
here's object one, here's object two, here's object three, mm -hmm. right? But if that whatever terabyte is millions of objects that are small, then you might actually want a database because it might be a pain for you to be managing folders and subfolders and whatever. Again, that's that's kind of just at the high level, trying to keep it inside the concept of what we're talking about here. Chapter yeah, three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Becky, the other thing I would say is be careful trying to copy other companies and other people. Just because they're doing something doesn't mean they're necessarily doing it in a special sure. way. Um, simply because I've read lots of stories of people who just use lots of snowflake services, for example, that allows you to be really inefficient at scale, right? It doesn't mean that they're being efficient. They're just clobbering it with a lot of compute power. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, yeah. so in terms of the, the chapter material, the last thing, I, I uh, this came up, but I, I didn't realize I didn't scroll. So, um, uh, so just in terms of pre-computing stuff, so you can have materialized views. I, I've used these fairly often. I have some sort of denormalized flattened data that's in my regular relational database. And so, um, you know, the, the, um, the transactional data may be, you know, one row per item purchased, but maybe you just want to say, okay, uh, but if it's like a supermarket, yes, there's one row per item, but then like when I, you know, when I, whatever, go to the store, I bought 50 things. So maybe I just want one, um, I don't know what to call that, that unit, but you know, one row per, you know, customer co going to the store and buying a bunch of things, right? And so um, I could store the subtotals for each person when they went to the store instead of having just each individual item, you know, loaf of bread, bottle of milk. Um, and if that's really, you know, requested a lot, then instead of just having a virtual conceptual view, you can have a materialized view. And so you can actually have a second copy of the data that stores, hey, yes, Ted bought eggs, milk, bread, but by the way, that whole thing, when he paid with his credit card, the total was $100. Okay, so you can materialize that. And then the extension of that is you can store um, different possible subtotals and that's where there's a two-dimensional example in the book. In my notes, I tried to do more of a three-dimensional example uh, um, where, you, where you can have cubes. And so again, that's pre-computing totals and subtotals. All right, so then in terms of the summary, uh, relational does updates in place. So that was one of the first questions we got. That's sort of the intuitive way of doing things. You only keep one copy, but bad side of this is it requires random access. Um, Log-based techniques concentrate the writes into fewer sequential chunks, but now you've got multiple copies and you've got multiple data structures. And so you have this complexity, uh, which again, for this use case didn't sound so bad, but when we get to like transactions, then I think it's gonna get pretty hairy. Um, you have a data warehouse that maybe you optimize differently in terms of your star schemas, your column stores, whatnot. And then again, um, we have not really talked about multiple servers and how you implement these things. And so uh, um, definitely front ends like web servers that are stateless, very, very easy to scale horizontally. Um, when you start dealing with data that has state, then things get trickier. And so uh, I haven't read ahead, but that's where I think things are going to get really interesting in, in part two, which is like chapters five through, I don't know what, five through something, five through 10 or something like that. All right, any other comments or questions? Does uh, Microsoft Analysis Server support materialized cubes? Yes, yeah, so what what Microsoft used to call SQL Server Analysis Servers or whatever, uh, OLAP cubes, that was the primary function of that. I don't hear a lot about it these days. So I suspect that other things like, like scaling horizontally and column stores have sort of uh, gotten most of the attention as opposed to cubes these days. Yeah. 
Anything else? I have sort of a side comment. I, I think that for me, it would be useful um, as an addition to the book, if there was some way that we could have some sort of simulated database, basically, and we say, here's using this technology, here's the performance of these various different queries and use cases, and then here's a comparison um, using all, an alternative. And then if we could compare between the two and we could say, oh, look, because of this um, implementational detail, there's this hot spot in the in the queries or something like that. I think that that would add a lot to 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 the learning for me. Um, okay, but I don't I'm know not sure how, how easy that is to do, but I will definitely keep in mind in terms of if the book doesn't have clear examples of like contention hot spots difficulties uh, when we talk about the different distributed systems, then I think, yes, that will be very helpful to, to go through examples. Um, I know we're already like way over time, but um, one of the things I did add to the content here is, um, and if some people need to leave, I, I, I understand, but I just wanted to do a very simple case study about SQLite. This is about as simple as you can get. Um, just to show how even the, the concepts in chapter three, without talking about too much else, when you're talking about a real world implementation of the, one of the simplest possible databases, there's still extra levels of secondary indexes and abstractions and things that need to be dealt with. And so, um, you know, it, it, it's horrible when people ask, well, what should I do about this? And the answer is, it depends, right? It depends on your workload. It depends on this, whatever. But, but these are the reasons why, unfortunately, it's really difficult because there's just so many complexities. So, so for those of you who can stay, um, SQLite is super simple database. It's just one single file that gets stored on your disk, okay? It is not a client server technology. It, it, it just completely, you know, runs... Um, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, I, this may not be exactly the right way to say it, but it runs in the thread in the process of your, your application. It just becomes part of your application. There's very little concurrency supported. So um, if anybody needs to do a write, they lock the file and that, uh, that locks everybody else out. Nobody can do a write, nobody can do a read while you're doing a write. But multiple reads can happen concurrently from different threads. That's a tiny little bit of concurrency. Um, so you can store data in there and there's some other things in terms of like uh, views and, 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 and whatnot, but um, triggers. Um, but we talked about these briefly. It, it does support full text indexes and spatial indexes. So there's already some complexity in terms of what kind of data is in there. There's regular data, there's regular indexes, there's full text spatial indexes. And the storage is pretty straightforward. Every table is a, is a B tree. So if you have a client's table, it's a B tree. If you have a product's table, it's B tree. Um, all the indexes are B trees. And there's one special table called SQLite master, and that lists all of your objects. So it lists all the tables, all the indexes. It also lists anything else you have. It lists triggers, it lists everything. Um, so if we stopped here, we would say, this sounds like a pretty simple thing. It in terms of chapter three, it's using B trees. It's not using LSM trees, it's just using B trees. But if we use the author's very loose terminology of index of any other kind of metadata, then you start to see that there is other data that, that SQLite has to, either has to or, or want to keep track of. So one thing it has is, um, it has to understand the concept of, of unused, fragmented, free memory within the file. So it has to have a free list, okay? Where it keeps track of pages that don't actually have anything in them. So you delete something and now you delete a table and now there's, you know, you know, pages that aren't used anymore, they go onto the free list. It has this concept of pointer maps. So when a tree parents point down to children, um, in B tree, it's not required that children point back to their parents, but these pointer maps actually create the reverse pointers. And uh, this is used if, if you're trying to defragment the file. So if you're trying to get rid of that empty space and, and cluster stuff together. 
Within each Beechree page, there are headers that need to be updated whenever you do any kind of update or write or delete or whatever. That might not cost you too much because you're tending to write to the disk the entire page and the header is part of the page. But nevertheless, there's a little bit of compute overhead. Um, and there's also this indirection because we talk about things being sorted. Um, so within you know uh, the, the leaf of a page, you might say, oh, well, this page has A through B. And so it has you know, AAA at the beginning and you know, BZZZ at the end. But the reality is nobody actually stores things in that order. Um, and so there's actually this pointer array that says logically they should be in this alphabetical order, but physically we stored them in the page in wherever. And so there are these, these other data structures um, and so this is why the devil's really in the details. So even something as super simple as SQLite um, has all this extra overhead data structures compute that's going on um, to, to manage what's gotta be just about the world's simplest possible real, I mean, I, mean, I looked on Wikipedia, it says SQLite is the sixth most commonly used database. So this is a real system. This is not a toy made up thing. This is. This is used by various products and operating systems and you know whatever certain versions of iPhones or whatever like actually used you know this um, but e but but again even as simple as it tries to be um, and it is pretty simple but that there's still sort of this other stuff and so this stuff affects how it actually performs under various workloads so it's not just the theoretical performance of B trees there's this other stuff on top of it. And that's why it's so, unfortunately, so much of a, it depends. You need to really deeply look at your workload. And this is even before you, you think about caching, um, which, is, which can happen outside of SQLite again. Um, so anyway, just wanted to kind of add that as a, as a way of, of highlighting why it is, unfortunately, there aren't good answers that says, hey, if you do this, just use product A. If you have that just use product B it's just hard yeah. yeah Ted I've been waiting all my life for that <laughs> Who's going to tell me that well I will use I, I will use my rule of thumb okay which is if you're not really big and don't have an extreme use case whatever you choose don't choose something expensive I know I, I think part of this <laughs> is a conversation for another time uh I'm still trying to get my heads around whether or not we're big or small and why is it, it just seems there's a lot of complexity in what we do. And that actually leads me to a one question for, I mean, since um, everyone or most of everyone here uh, do do a lot of this kind of data science stuff. I'm just curious, like we just talked about this database and how the different formats and whatnot, but let's just say that, uh, Machine learning, one of the good things that it, it can deal with is the a lot of the features that you're inputting into the model. So in your actual work, let's say you need to really take in um, a data file that has lots of lots of features, but isn't that those features are technically like the columns in the in the tables? Or are you guys really having a different kind of structure to take in the data? I'm just very curious. Like if I'm if we'll, if we're not talking necessarily about images and stuff like that, right? If we're talking about more or less like tabular data, in my mind, I, I just don't know how you guys are connecting to tables that that are feeding these could be thousands of features into the model, but then how do you store it? How do you kind of yeah make it effective? I don't know if somebody else has a comment. I would say my rule of thumb is store everything as additional features, keep going wider, wider, wider until something breaks and it forces you not to. But but yeah, if you can, just, just keep adding features. Gotcha. And any other opinion? Because there's like, Russia has a 1600 column limit. So <laughs> you, you, you technically, um, and, and like I said before, our survey data set, a single data set can have 9,000 columns. I, I mean, that's a different topic, like why we have so many, but I'm just saying, uh, yeah, we may not have a ton of data compared to other companies, but 
we do have a fairly kind of a peculiar situation here. Are you normalizing your data? Like, and I don't mean normalizing in the machine learning perspective, but normalizing in a data modeling perspective? Exactly. Like, and I don't I know how to answer that question. Are, many of those are probably binary features that represent categorical variables. So like for multiple choice questions, you'd have a different binary column for each one. Right. And I, I think, that's a, yeah. It's an inefficient way of databasing it. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a very efficient way of doing machine learning on it. So you want to you want to use the right format for what you're trying to do. Right, but technically you are still, you still need to store the data in the, like each column, even if we like transform those, but each column still represents a one possible feature, so to speak, right? And Where if let's say we, we do have lots and lots of questions, like I said before, we could have like 50 minute, 50 minute survey, which kind of translates into a lot of questions per record. Mm -hmm. And we have, we have a number of years of data, mm -hmm. right? Let's say five years of data about how people like certain movies and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so it doesn't sound like a very complex issue, but in reality, it, it just, um, it, it is a very it, slow. It may have been made complex by someone doing the data engineering and not doing it well by not normalizing the data like what Keegan said. Um, that does yeah, not I mean, sound like to me a lot of data. Um, and it should, it, it should be possible to store that data efficiently within the limits of most modern database systems. Yeah, so I would say I would store that information on disk in a relational way and it would, it would, it would reduce the amount of size. And it's clearly yes. more data than you can sort of eyeball, like imagine an Excel spreadsheet. It's more data than you can eyeball at a time. But basically, if you don't get past, I'll say randomly, 10 million, it's not big. For a computer mm -hmm. these days, you know, anything less than that is it's just not big. So, um, and like a Pandas data frame, by the way, is a column store. So physically, uh, it's stored, the columns of, of mm -hmm. stuff are all together. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really care if you have a thousand or five thousand columns in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I like Ted's approach to starting small. Just um, start with a, a, some number of features and work your way up, and and don't worry about it until it breaks. And then you can start f figuring out how to be more optimal in which columns you're using for your modeling, and then maybe doing some PCA, maybe doing some data normalization. Yeah, yeah, we'll, solve we'll, we'll the problem definitely do that. Right. Mm -hmm. So Becky, just adding on to what the guys are saying. So the, you would work forwards and then backwards again, right? So forwards, you would start off with whatever was in your data store, S3 or relational database or whatever. You might expand that out into more columns and I'll pick an easy one, right? So you might have a date column. And in order to figure out your model, you might expand that date, date column out into you know, the month of the year, the year, the day of the week, the day of the month, all that sort of stuff, right? And then you would feed that into your model. Eventually, you'd come up with a model, right? Um, but it may turn out that that model doesn't really care about most of those columns. So then you'd end up throwing them away, right? Um, in, the, in the final thing. So that's what I mean by you work forward, as Ted was saying, kind of just keep expanding and adding more columns kind of thing. And then once you figured out what the model actually needs, which is what Hobson is saying, um, then you just, you know, re-optimize down to just the things that you need to be feeding into your models. Yep, it, it, it makes sense, I think. I think I'm just curious, like how, I mean, what, what would be like, do you guys have any sort of this kind of challenges with dealing with uh, lots of, this is, uh, this is the, being fed into the model at the same time. Like this is the quintessential challenge of data science. See, so it's it's the it's the challenge of data engineering. Everybody from a beginner working with a small data set deals with it um, to people professionals dealing with large data sets. It's not a, da a large data set problem. It's just the problem of uh, doing feature engineering. And so, because um, if you have a small computer or you're trying to do it all in RAM or you, um, you're, you're trying to do some recommendation engine that requires you to have all the columns. It's, it's, it can be hard even with small data sets. So you have to get really good at choosing the right features. Yeah, but I, I will say that I haven't heard anything yet, Becky, that says to me that you couldn't just brute force this in the most obvious 
representation. Now, it might be slightly faster if you did A or you did B, but will it actually just work if you just right. say, hey, I just want rows and columns and just, I, I think it should. Right, that's, that's, the, that's the main direction we're heading right now, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want to uh, try this, so there's some really good plugins for um, for pandas uh, that use like H5 files or other formats that don't actually pull it all into RAM. So if it doesn't all fit into RAM and you can't do just standard pandas, you can even just use pandas with one of these uh, wraparounds. I forget what they're called. But. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, I'm learning a lot about Dask these days, Dask. but basically um, that's what I'm saying is just keep, keep doing the easy, simple, straightforward mm -hmm. thing until it breaks. And then, and then if it breaks, ask, is there some really simple thing I can do, <laughs> like, like change my import, you know, and so say dask.readcsv instead of pd.readcsv, and that solves your problems, great. And then if that breaks, then you're like, crap, now I actually need to figure out if I'm going to use All the Spark yeah. thing or some other thing or whatever, and, and then you need to actually, like, make the effort. Or is there someone actually solving problems with your data, Becky? Or is it is this just a theoretical sometime down the road we might consider doing this? I think I think right now it's a little bit theoretical right now, but for example, I mean this is a forever question, right? Um, like how how can we predict the box office uh, performance better for any given movie? And you could introduce all kinds of features to it and and we continue to collect data and, and all of that. So um, yeah, and, and the data can be, you know, consumers feedback, it can be a ton of metadata about the, the cast, about the director, about everything about the, this movie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, for me, my, my sort of keep it simple rule of thumb, right? Is just do it easy, just keep adding features. If you're like, eh, it works, but it's kind of slow. I mean, if you're paying some analyst, you know, on the order of 100K a year, like buying a really fast computer for 10K is nothing mm -hmm. compared to, you know, the, the cost of, of labor, right? So if you can just keep solving your problems easily just by, by, by not having to think about it and just, just throw a little bit of hardware at it, I, I would say it's a very reasonable approach until basically until you can't, it's broken, it just won't work. It's, it's not a good idea to try to anticipate all the problems before you just dive in and do it. Uh, Agile has, has proven to be the only way to do any kind of software development, data science or anything. Just do it and uh, if it becomes a problem, fix it. Got it, thank you. All right. Well, I appreciate so many of you are still with us. Um, was there anybody else who wanted to ask a question or, or make a comment? Um, this is, again, uh, in case anybody joined in the middle. So, so we are going to take a two week break over the holidays. Our next chapter discussion will be January 9th. Um, so, uh, so certainly, again, we'll, we'll be on Slack if you, you know, want to ask questions either as you're reading the book or about stuff we've already covered, but um, hey, Now's your chance if you want to ask something before we go. Uh, Ryan dropped a very interesting link to the ranking of popular databases. It's a lot of fun. So while it is open, look at it. I mean, the chat. I can repost that in the Slack too. It is pretty interesting to see because they also have it split by the various different types. So if you want to see what the most popular graph database or time series or document or whatever, um, you can sort by that too. Yes, I was surprised that among document database, MongoDB is the best, very high, very far from everybody else. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best, but it's the most popular right now, which might mean it's the best. It might just be that it's yeah. been around. It might long. mean the people who bought Mongo X years ago haven't gotten rid of it yet. But SQLite on that's only, what, number nine or something like that? So mm -hmm. not quite as high as what Wikipedia said. But still, it's, I mean, it's up there. It's, it's not fake. It's, 
you know, it's really used inside of products. It's only two ahead of Microsoft Access, though, which is <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that's that that's a fair criticism. <laughs> I hate I wonder, access. But I do wonder why Russia is so low, though. What is low, Becky? Amazon Redshift. Oh. I, I think competition. I mean, Snowflake yeah. really owns the data warehousing market right now. I mean, mm. Snowflake's a lot more expensive, but they're when most companies switch to a data warehouse of a cloud, they use Snowflake. Yeah. So you've you've got compute, you've got competition between AWS, GCP, Azure cloud environments. Then you've got com competition from third-party vendors. And I think to a certain extent, you have competition from other Amazon products. Yeah. Where people maybe could use Redshift, but use some other AWS option. I'm looking at their methodology for determining this score. And one of them is, is basically mentions on Stack Overflow. <laughs> so it might actually be that being a very difficult to use database increases your ranking because a lot of people are asking questions about it. I don't think that's necessarily the case, but it could be an interesting way to. Yeah, so, so, so SQLite could be, could be underrepresented because it's easy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's the same reason why a JavaScript is more popular than Python. Um, it, it's just, um, anyway, yeah, be careful. Popularity isn't a good thing. But it or, certainly does give us an idea. Oh, sorry, go on ahead. On an FAQ database, it's a bad thing. On, uh, on some of the cloud databases, I Google Cloud just released, um, well, actually it didn't just release, it released this earlier this year, back in January, but you can now run BigQuery cross cloud. So you can run their, their BigQuery engine on like AWS S3 and I think on AWS Redshift even though it's a Google Cloud product and also on Microsoft Azure. So but the data warehousing, even though they're proprietary, like Google's allowing you to go cross cloud. So I also have a quick question here. So, so looking at Cassandra, which it says here is a Y column store, is that, can, can that be interpreted as the opposite of Amazon Redshift type of store? Well, Redshift is still SQL database and Cassandra is no SQL. So it's not oh. only SQL. Um, I, I'm not familiar exactly with the Cassandra's um, query language. I think it looks like SQL, but mm. it can do things that SQL can't do. I, I, don't, I don't think it's relational, but- Gotcha. I, I'm not going, I, I don't know enough about it to comment. Cassandra's weird. Um, I'm planning on, on reading more about it throughout the course of this book. It is definitely not a vanilla anything. It is not a vanilla B tree and it is not a vanilla column store. So, um, so just like I sort of did this case study for SQLite, I don't know if I'll present it, but, but certainly it's, you see it's up there. Uh, it, it has some real performance. That's why people have, have used it, but uh, um, it's complicated. <laughs> I have a question for you. You mentioned something about the pandas data frame and the underlying storage type. I'm trying to find resources online, but I don't see anything mentioning how is it actually stored in memory. Oh, I was just simply commenting that if you have a panda data frame and it's got uh, uh, 12 columns and, 10, and 100 rows, Okay, that what that really is, is 1200 item column stores. Okay, so it is column oriented first, and then row oriented second. Uh, uh, visually, when I look at it, like I do ahead of the first, you know, five rows, I think in my brain about it being row oriented, maybe because I'm a database guy historically, right? But that's not the way it's physically stored. So, it, so from an efficiency it's, perspective, you can think of it more as a column store. It's, so it's not think of it, or is it a resource that you have in mind? That's what I'm trying to find. The, the physical storage is not at all related to the the API. 
So just because the column is first doesn't mean it's storing it that way. Because you can do a dot transpose on a data frame, and and, it, it, and that's zero time. And it doesn't move anything in RAM. And so switching columns. So sorry, yes. So so the, I'm talking about the default. Actually, I don't I don't know George. I mean, I've gotten this all like verbally. I, I don't know. I haven't looked for documentation on the default pandas implementation, but Hobbs is right. Uh, uh, the the implementation is not required, it's not guaranteed, and that's how Dask is able to sort of swap in and uh, QDF is able to just swap in because they say, hey, as long as you, you know, when somebody says merge, you do a merge, and when somebody says whatever square brackets, you pull out the requisite subset, right? You can store it anywhere you want, and there's like sparse implementations, right? So, so I should be careful so I'm just talking about the default implementation, the vanilla one, when you just take regular pandas and you just create a simple little data frame. I have to look at the code, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, as some people may know, I like to comment and joke about it. So I started as an R guy. Um, it's, it, there's, there's clear documentation on the R side that says that our data frames are columns and it's just a list of columns. There's very loose, very little relationship between columns. Now you can actually have two three-dimensional matrices or whatever, that's slightly different, but, um, but data frames. And, mm -hmm. and Pandas was sort of modeled after our data frames. Uh, but but I, you're right, I haven't mm -hmm. actually seen like a Medium article that says, hey, in case you're wondering, this is how Pandas default implementation stores data. That's what I was looking for online. I couldn't find it. <laughs> but you know, p pointers are stored next to each other. In C, anybody ever worked with C pointers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they are stored next to each other. You can actually, if you want, uh, from a data frame, if you want some particular indices, you can actually go to pointers and to say that you want pointers from this one to this one. But the pointers themselves are not values. Yes, I'm, I'm simply saying that if, if you had a data frame with 20 columns and 20 rows. I know, I know how it works in R. I even know that the matrix in R is actually one vector. Right, and but I'm not talking about matrix, I'm talking about data frames. Mm -hmm. So, 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 I mean, I could write a little bit of code yes, to time but it, but if you- underneath the Python and underneath R, we have C. Yes, and so what I'm saying is that if mm -hmm. you said, pull me 20 values from the same column, it's gonna run faster than if you say, pull me 20 values from the same row. Yes. Even if you use whatever, like iloc. And so the, 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 the conceptual syntax is the same. You're just saying zero through 19 on this axis, zero through 19 on that axis. Uh, it, yeah. is, it is column stored in, in nature. All right, thanks guys. Anything, anything else? Any other questions or comments? Are you guys liking this book so far? Yes. <laughs> I think this chapter probably is, this chapter is most above my head <laughs> right now, maybe. <laughs> From what, all, all these trees and structure, I, I think it's, it's really above my head, but <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I will just keep, uh, keep listening to you guys. Well, well, weren't you with us when we did support vector machines? <laughs> well, I, I would say at, at least on that side, I, I conceptually, I can understand what's going on. And here, it's hard for me to think about all this indexing in, in, in certain way. Um, yeah, that's a block for me <laughs> in my brain. <laughs> all right. So, so maybe maybe for future chapters, like, like Ryan was saying, specific case examples and actually showing the diagrams maybe is, is a good idea. 
but you guys have been great. You, 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 you and Ryan are both very good teachers. Thanks, Becky. You're here. All right. Well, um, again, thanks for those of you who stuck with us um, for the discussion. Uh, I always, I always enjoy the discussion, and I always learn things. I mean, I appreciate everybody who's helped answer other people's questions. That that's a huge benefit. So I think we'll we'll call it officially a wrap here. And then, um, uh, if any people want to stick around, then we can talk a little bit about Kaggle competitions. Um, but we're um, again way off the timeline. So <laughs> thanks. Good seeing okay, everybody. Happy holidays, everyone. Happy holidays. Yeah, happy holidays. Happy holidays, everyone.